boys and girls. Welcome to Flip Friday. Yay. Take two since the batteries died the last time. So, uh, we're going to watch a video today. Well, you're going to watch a video today about me teaching you. Remember, it is a video, so you do have the ability to pause and resume and rewind and even stop if you need to. Uh, so, if you're going too slow with the note taking to keep up, then, <laughs> really, if I'm going too fast, then you can just get in there and you can click those buttons and then you can keep up. What I would even do, pop the Moodle page up to the side and then you'll be able to type in questions right as you think of them. And be good digital citizens, children. If someone asks a question and you know the answer or you think you can figure it out, go through the process with them. That way we can really maximize our learning. Now this is not only the last Flip Friday of our unit, but this is the last lecture of the unit. Remember, test on Wednesday. Be prepared. After this, we've just got labs in between us and learning. Sorry. See ya. Somebody wanted to come in and watch, but I didn't let them. This is just for you, meteorology. All right, so we're going to talk today about weather modification. Uh, really, we're going to focus on the things that are actually possible for us to do. Back in the 60s, uh, 1962, it got cut in 1983, the U.S. military wanted to be able to uh, really regulate and control hurricanes. And that was one of the things they were like, by 1983, uh, we're going to be able to swing hurricanes and we're going to save American lives by sending them to Cuba or other places that we hate. So, yeah, that's not really a thing that we can do. Otherwise, uh, Katrina wouldn't have been a thing. And then on top of that, there's another program that was actually uh, proposed in 1996, and the Air Force ran with it a little bit with the goal that by 2025, they would be able to control and start weather and just like wreak havoc on our enemies. So if we went to war, say, in the Middle East, we could kick up a sandstorm to end all sandstorms. If we went to war, like in Korea, we could like hit them with lightning and hail and craziness. And in 2003, they were like, yeah, um... That's not really a thing. But if you want, I'll put this link here down in the description, and you'll actually be able to read the report that was presented by different people in the military of the things that we should be able to do by 2025, none of which uh, we can really do. However, there are three different categories of weather modification that are actually possible. There are ones that use tons and tons of energy. They expel lots of energy and make some modifications. Those are usually pretty low to the surface. And then there's ones that actually alter the land, like you can actually change the landscape and you can think of stuff like, you know, if you're in the city, it's hotter, stuff like that. So you can change the surface topography to actually make uh, the atmosphere around it have a different radiant heat profile and therefore alter the weather. And then there's also ones that uh, work with the atmosphere. And these are the ones that we're gonna focus on today that are pretty cool, uh, stuff that will either trigger, alter, or intensify the weather. And these are things that are uh, not, uh, the triggering doesn't work so well. We can't really trigger weather out of nowhere, but we can alter and or intensify uh, existing weather. And we have had some moderate success with those. So we're gonna get into uh, some of the real weather modification practices that are actually in use right now. One, a big one, uh, China's especially looking to do cloud seeding. I showed uh, another video on that. Maybe I'll uh, description click things. You can watch the video again if you missed it last time. There's actually also fog and cloud and dispersal, which is the opposite of cloud seeding. There's hail suppression, where we're tired of people being hailed so much, so we suppress it. And then uh, frost prevention, which is a big one for agriculture. And the frost prevention, that one probably has the most uh, practical usage. So let's get into it. Uh, cloud seeding, again, we've talked about this. And you basically shoot particles up into the air that will cause clouds to form more. It's not something like we can't just make clouds appear in a clear blue sky with no clouds. You've got to have that water vapor. You need to have existing clouds. But if we use silver iodide, it actually works as a very nice freezing nuclei that will cause clouds to develop, especially get more vertical development than you would otherwise be possible, and really turn those cumulus clouds into some cumulonimbus clouds and get some nice steady rain in the drier parts of the world. 
And salt flares is another one that has been used quite often, shoot them up really high, because that's a very nice hydrophilic nuclei. In addition to that, uh, so there's been some studies using different mountain clouds, those lenticular clouds, in sort of to expand on those and really get them to seed out and move to rain on the other side of mountains instead of just the one side of mountains. And uh, also, I showed you pictures earlier, how pollution can add to the clouds. Also, these uh, are types of pollution uh, that could uh, damage the atmosphere. So there's that. For more on cloud seedings, uh, link in the description to a uh, cloud seeding to try and combat uh, global warming uh, right there from an old thing called Project Earth. That's kind of cool. All right, cloud dispersal. This is the opposite of cloud seeding, obviously. It usually uses a lot of dry ice, which releases CO2. A nice greenhouse gas tends to uh, really uh, create a lot of uplifting, a lot of instability, and you're thinking, wait. Doesn't that make the clouds more cloudy? But what it actually does, it makes the clouds too cloudy, too fast, and causes snow showers to form, which the, wrecks all the moisture that's in the cloud and gets it out and puts it on the ground. This was actually invented by the Air Force and is actually used to clear foggy runways in airports. One of my friends is an airline pilot. He says they've actually used this technique, dump a bunch of snow on the runways, and they real fast plow it off. And it uh, doesn't work very well in warm weather, so that advection fog that we had before, uh, like a couple days ago, that wouldn't really work. But in the winter time, any of those low hanging clouds, you can get those out of the way. Very nice and easy. Hail suppression. This one's probably my favorite, mostly because it's really, really old and moderately ridiculous. What they actually did was they invented this thing called the hail cannon, which was a cannon that shot stuff up in the air to, like, break up the hail. Yeah, there are also shockwave generators. Uh, basically, the idea is you've got hail, and it goes up in the cloud, and then it falls down, and then it gets pushed back up, and then it grabs more stuff, and gets bigger, and falls down, and it keeps on doing that. So the idea was if you hit it with a strong wave, it would break it apart before it ever hit the ground. And those worked about as well as the shooting actual things at the hail. However, we do have this documentation of hail cannons, and you can see here, it's basically a phonograph that you could turn that would make the record play really, really loud and shoot really loud, low noises, high energy, low frequency up into the sky, and then hail would fall on them anyway. If, however, you're really curious and thinking, I don't know, modern technology, we should be able to break up the hail, you can actually go to hailcannon.com and you can buy yourself a certified actual hail cannon in case we go to war with hail. Katie Ball, please report to the office. So let's talk frost prevention. Uh, one of the big things you can do is just cover up the plants. My family, uh, for years, has used like leaves to just cover up all the plants and uh, you know keep the roots and keep the bases safe, especially in the winter time. You can also, in my garden, we drape cloths out a lot. Uh, newspapers work pretty well. You want to make sure you take them off during the day, but especially at night or in the morning when it can get frosty, just to cover up the plants, especially the early risers that come in the early spring. Another one is smudge fires, yes, more pollution. Uh, basically, you make a really smoky fire in the area and maybe around or near your garden, and it puts up this billows of warmer smoke that just basically prevents uh, water from hitting the dew point and then uh, being put down, being condensated, and then freezing, because that's really what frost is. And then there's air mixers, which are really big fans that sort of do the same thing, sort of stop the water from being deposited in the first place from precipitating out. And then uh, warm water shower, sounds exactly what it is. They take hot water or warm water because you don't want to kill the plants, and they just water the garden with it all night long. So the idea is then, you know, it won't freeze because it's warm, and I'm sure that's not expensive at all. These ones that cost the most and work the best are orchard heaters. They just take humongous, uh, probably natural gas or propane heaters, and they periodically place them sort of like those big, you know, uh, deck and patio heaters, and just set them out there in the orchard and hopefully don't burn all the trees down. Now remember, boys and girls, flip class is on. Don't forget to get it in the video. I'll add this video uh, right here. So don't forget to get in the forum. Don't forget to vote for which video you liked better. Did you like it when I was hiding in the dark? 
or did you like this one better, or did you like other one better? As always, don't forget to Moodle. Watch this video by Friday.